As you can see, here's the box of bits ready for uh, Mustang Sally, the classic 350. Uh, she's going in the workshop this week to have the Kent cam fitted. As you see, I've got the special tools, the crankshaft, locking pin, the cam, locking device, all the gaskets and uh, oil filter and everything, because she's going to have a complete oil change and everything at the same time. And that should be happening this week, all going well. Well, look here. It's uh, Friday. And Mustang Sally's back from the workshop. She's had her uh, 3,000 mile uh, service. She's got a nice new Hitchcock's exhaust on. She's got Fuel X light. She's got a full DNA intake uh, kit and filter. She's got the full Monty of the tune-up parts. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to start her up in a minute. Hey, up. Uh, it's me. There, yeah, Norfolk Thunderbolt. Anyway, uh, you can see I'm wearing a different hat today. And uh, uh, my beard's growing in nicely, which is just well because my chin was getting cold. Anyway, this is uh, basically an introduction to uh, the Royal Enfield Classic 350 TNT Special Edition. As you all know, those of you who have been watching regularly, it's, uh, it's uh, my kind of project bike. It's uh, my two fingers up to the foreign bureaucrats who foisted uh, Euro 5 on us. And uh, also to those people who say, uh, well, if you wanted more power, you should have gotten a bigger, more powerful bike. No. I wanted a 350 uh, for uh, reasons, uh, you know, because I'm getting older and well, no, I want something a bit lighter. But uh, I didn't see why I should uh, put up with the uh, Euro 5 nonsense. And as I'm an old school biker, and when I say old school, I mean I've been riding 48 years now, and I spent a lot of that time tinkering and tuning my own bikes. And I didn't see why the 350 Classic should be any different. In fact, actually, my Meteor is also stage two tuned. Um, so there you go. Uh, if you're into your bikes and you like tinkering, then there's nothing wrong with the uh, Royal Enfields for that. They lend themselves to tinkering and tuning and stuff quite well. Uh, you just have to know which bits to use, and you also have to know who to ask uh, for advice and stuff, which is, of course, what I'm doing. And that brings me to uh, thanking various people and organisations in my quest for more talk. I'm not after top speed, I'm after more talk. So that uh, in overtakes, I can overtake safely and smartly. And uh, also, when we do get the uh, odd hill that we encounter here in Norfolk, and probably later on when I go up north, various places around the Wales, uh, when there's more hills to be done, I've got the extra power in hand. Also, I did it because I uh, wanted to prove it can be done. You know. Anyway, uh the people and organisations that have helped me out. Right, well, first of all, of course, Hitchcocks, who is during the whole process of me tuning my bikes. I can just pick up the phone and ask for advice and have a chat with them, and they're always happy to help. And to be perfectly honest, if you want to know anything about tuning uh, Royal Enfields uh, with off-the-shelf parts or combinations thereof, then they're the people to talk to, because they're the ones that are doing all the development and testing of things like the Kent Cam, which I've just fitted. Um, anyway, the uh, bike now, it has the Fuel X, it has the DNA filter intake kit, it has the uh, Hitchcock stainless steel free flow exhaust, which saved a hell of a lot of weight. And something like seven kilos lighter now. And... Uh, um, because what well, a lot of people don't realise, the downpipes, uh, double thickness on the factory fed item, and uh, they're really heavy. 
So you, yeah, you're getting about seven, you're getting somewhere in the region about seven kilos off the weight of the bike once you take the factory fitted system off and throw it away. Um, so uh, so anyway, there's those items. That's the stage two tune, but then I've taken it to stage three with the Kent Cam, which I must say is a much, much nicer uh, manufactured part than the original cam that came out. Um, one of these days, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll dig the old camera out and show you. It's, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's just not as nicely made as the Kent cam. The Kent cam is like a piece of precision jewellery, you know, um, to look at. So you, you can see it's a quality thing. Uh, anyway, that brings me to Superbike Wearers, Great Yarmouth, who uh, did the actual fitting of the cam for me while they were doing the 3,000 mile service for me. Uh, the reason I didn't do this myself was because it's been so cold lately. That and the fact that I don't yet have a motorcycle lift in my garage. So uh, it was a bit of a non-starter. And I spoke to Billy the Yeti and whatnot. And we're both, you know, we're both advancing years a bit. And uh, and it was just too bloody cold um, to sit in a cold, wet, you know, uh, on a cold concrete floor trying to scrabble around underneath the bike so I thought you know it's it's due for a three thousand mile service so I send in the suit bike wearers through my local people. Uh and despite the fact they'd never done uh they changed out a cam on the that's the first one they did. Uh and no problem at all. Uh they sorted that out because I'd supplied them the special tools needed and stuff that I'd got from Hitchcock's. And they did a lovely job, and they didn't actually charge me much more than the uh, cost of the service, to be perfectly honest. So they were gr absolutely great value for money as well in that, in that respect. So, uh, yeah, if you've got any bits and pieces, they've got a couple of mechanics down there who really know their stuff, and, uh, you know, go go have a word with them. Um, anyway... So, uh, from Superbike Wearers. Now, I have had several people, fellow YouTubers, have aided and abetted me in this uh, little endeavour. Um, Ian Hughes, obviously, has been very encouraging and was interested to see the results. Um, there was uh, Bruce Matheson up at uh, Coast Rider Scotland. Thank you for the bonus trains, Bruce. Um and also your encouragement. Um, Bruce, in fact, is actually starting on a project of his own. So if you go over his channel, Coast Rider Scotland, you can find the videos about that. Uh, and that involves a Royal Enfield engine. Uh, so that's quite interesting. And of course, if you can help him uh, in his uh, pro new project, uh, give him a shout, because I'm sure he'll be glad of any pointers, advice and uh, leads for various things he wants. Um, oh, who else? Oh, yes, Glyn Owen. Uh, Glyn Owen has done a whole series on stripping down and rebuilding a meteor, uh, which you can use as a pretty much as a how-to guide or how-not-to guide uh, on all things uh, J-Platform. He's in the process at the moment doing the same thing now with a classic 350, so... If you watch those videos that he makes, um, they're informative, entertaining, uh, quite relaxing actually as well, and uh, and will tell you everything you need to know about uh, uh, dismantling and rebuilding a a, a J platform bike. Uh, he's been very very supportive as well uh, with my little project. Um, and uh, who was the last one now? Oh yes. Can't forget Tiger Ness. Now, Tiger Ness has done quite a few videos on fitting uh, aftermarket parts to Classic 350. He's done videos on the free flow stainless steel exhaust from Hitchcock. He's done the Fuel X. He's done the uh, DNA filter set. And the thing that caused me to pull the trigger is he put the cam in his 350 Classic. Now, he's, not, he's done a slightly different than me. He's uh, used Hitchcock's intake plate with a standard filter and he's used the uh, 
decap pipe with the standard exhaust system. And then he's put the Kent cam in and he's got some marvellous results from it. And he's got a video up of that. He's, he made a two-part video on that. And uh, he's, uh, if the, uh, according to the dyno figures from uh, Hitchcock's, he's now getting 20.5 horsepower, I would say. Uh, the rear wheel, that's rear wheel horsepowers, not, um, not uh, at the crank, which is what usually gets quoted by a lot of manufacturers. Because they quote it at the crank because it's high end number. But of course, when you get to the a chassis dyno, it's considerably lower. And that's true of all the bikes, really. So any time, you know, most manufacturers only give you the uh, crankshaft horsepower output, but not the actual road wheel output. And there's a vast difference between the two. Well, once you get above a certain, certain CC and certain power output, it's all pretty academic, really. Because, uh, let's face it, most bikes over 500cc are pretty much overpowered for you know, legal road speeds. But that's another can of worms I'll get into another time. Anyway, uh, the thing is, is uh, that, um, you, what you do get from the uh, Stage 3 tune with, with the cam is you get more torque. Now, this is the thing. Now, a lot of people get confused between torque and power output. They're not, they're not really the same thing. When we talk about power output, we're talking about, uh, a lot of times, people mean uh, sheer power and top speed and whatnot. Well, that's not the aim of this particular project. The aim of this particular project is to give a useful increase in the torque at the back wheel, which allows for better, smarter overtaking on uh, A-roads and will also allow for climbing hills without having to drop down a gear. Um, which, you know, to be fair, the uh, the J-Series platform is very good at hills and a lot of people on YouTube have proven this by going uphill and down dale and uh, up mountainsides and whatnot with the standard uh, setup and it works. Uh, but with what I've done, it would work, but better. There's more talk to be had. You see, the thing is, and I have this on good authority, the bikes, the J-Platform engine was designed with 90 miles an hour in, in mind, which when you go back to the 1960s and 70s, a 350 engine was expected to be able to do 90 miles an hour when properly tuned, which is something a lot of people seem to have forgotten. But you know, I'm an old grey beard and I tend to read very arcane things and have arcane knowledge. Um, and the thing is, what's happened is with the Euro 5 nonsense they put on these bikes, which I, I say nonsense, because a machine that's below 1,000cc doesn't really need extra things to reduce the carbon. Our carbon emissions, according to Mag's latest figures uh, and, and other studies, is that we're only putting out about 1.4% of all carbon collectively as motorcyclists in this country. We're only causing 1.4%. I think it's one point. It's, it's ridiculously small. There's absolutely no real need for the sake of carbon footprint and zero carbon and all the, all the rest uh, to even be bothering with catalytic converters. Catalytic converters are a bloody chimera and they're gone. Catalytic converters on machines under 1,000cc are an absolute waste of time, waste of uh, palladium and other uh, rare minerals and things, and don't actually do anything useful except for being dead weight. Unfortunately, in this country, especially since Brexit, we're no longer subject to the Euro regulations so we can do as we bloody well like. So uh, if we want to tune our bikes... Uh, if we want to get rid of uh, troublesome contraptions that just add weight to the bike, we can do that. It's not subject to MOT, contrary to common belief. Uh, emissions currently are not a requirement of the MOT. And even if they do become 
uh, a requirement of the MOT in the future. The law is never, in the case of construction use regulations, the law cannot be applied retrospectively. So if you've got a bike, a current model, that you want to do as I've done and remove the, uh, the Euro 5 nonsense and get the bike running somewhere uh, the way the designers originally intended, then go ahead and do it because nobody can stop you. And uh, as for noise output, that's usually down to the ear of the MOT tester. So I suggest uh, you find a friendly MOT tester who's slightly deaf. He'll probably be slightly deaf by now as well if he's a sort of our age group. So that helps. Or sometimes they'll cop a deaf one because they just know that it's a, there's no real regulation. Uh, obviously, you don't want anything to be too intrusive. But then when you're talking about a single cylinder uh, four-stroke um, Royal Enfield with the proper 1960-style um, stainless exhaust fitted, it's not going to be. It's not hugely loud. I know some people uh, sort of said, "Oh, well, it's a bit loud with the air intake, or it's a bit loud with the with the uh, pea shooter pipe fit." And I, I think, well, you know, I've got ten at us anyway. I don't care. <laughs> And, uh, you know, and as for earplugs, I think they're a really bad idea. Uh, again, that's another can of worms I'll open another time. Um, <clears throat> anyway, this is uh, my declaration of independence from the bureaucrats and naysayers. Written steel and chrome. And also to give you guys an idea what you can do with these wonderful J-platform bikes. Anyway, I shall... Uh, as I shall say, uh, bye bye for now. And uh, we'll just now come up to be a clip of the bike. Now it's back from the workshop, just to give you a little taster before I do the forthcoming video ride, riding review video, which hopefully will be in the next few days if the weather holds. Okay, so I'll catch you all later on. And don't forget, keep your hands on the bars at all times, keep both wheels on the tarmac and be kind anyway now for the next clip here we go Well, that was well worth waiting for. I can't wait to go for a ride on her. That's going to be fun. That's going to be really fun. Anyway, the story is to be continued. As soon as I uh, feel up to getting a ride out, I shall set up my GoPro and we'll do a roll and review of her. All right, well, that's it for now. I'll see you on the next one.